doctor who refused to see a young girl from Newport because she was late for an emergency appointment. Five-year-old Ellie Mae Clark died late the same evening of an asthma attack. Dr Joanna Rowe was given a warning by the GMC and has now moved to another practice. James Williams reports. She was just perfect. That's how Brandy Clark from Newport remembers her granddaughter, five-year-old Ellie Mae. When you don't cope, you just get them and just take each day as it comes and you just try and get through it as best you can. Funny little girl, bright. Very intelligent. Just so funny and loving. Ellie May had a history of severe asthma, ending up in a high dependency unit five times, before receiving help from her local surgery a further five times in the six months before her death. On the 26th of January 2015, short of breath, Ellie May came home from school early. Her mother rang the surgery to book an emergency appointment. Due at the Grange Clinic in Newport at five, Ellie May's mother said she arrived at eight minutes past, although the receptionist said it was closer to 18 minutes past. Dr Joanne Rowe refused to see Ellie May because she was late and said she could come back the following morning. Later that night, while Ellie May was in bed, her parents discovered she was having a seizure and wasn't breathing. She died that night after doctors at the Royal Gwent Hospital were unable to resuscitate her. An internal investigation by an Arian Bevan Health Board found that doctors at this surgery had been alerted to the risk Ellie May faced of having an episode of severe, life-threatening asthma. It also adds that whilst some doctors turned no one away, Dr Rowe was most likely to turn patients away who turned up late. And the report also says that there was a consensus amongst reception staff here that Dr Rowe was unapproachable and volatile, although she denied that. The GP's case was passed to the disciplinary panel. Although Dr Rowe has been issued with a five-year warning, the General Medical Council, or GMC, dealt with her hearing behind closed doors. Ellie May's family received a copy of the Anairin Bevan report, but nothing from the GMC. They've apologised, but some are calling for greater transparency. If a, a warning is given and there's no explanation, the relatives of that uh, uh, patient who's been hurt have no idea on what basis the decision by the GMC was made. Now, the GMC may know, but I would say, uh, argue, as many members of the public would do, that that's no longer sufficient. Dr Joanne Rowe was suspended on full pay for six months, but continues to practice at this surgery in the Splot area of Cardiff. She has declined to comment on five-year-old Ellie Mae Clark's case. She just said, sorry, at least, at least that'd be something. Could have... I don't know, I don't know why that would have done, but... This would have been something. Brandy Clark ending that report by James Williams. A man once described as a gentle giant murdered his former girlfriend and her new boyfriend after researching revenge attacks, Cardiff Crown Court has heard. Zoe Morgan and Lee Simmons were stabbed outside Matalan in Cardiff last year. Andrew Saunders was said to have searched the internet to learn how to kill in the days leading up to the murders. Caroline Evans reports. In Zoe Morgan, it was said Lee Simmons had found love. They worked together in Matalan and were waiting outside the city centre store in Queen Street when they were attacked. Andrew Saunders was Zoe's previous boyfriend. The court heard how in the days leading up to the murders, he'd been stalking Zoe. Witnesses described how he'd first attacked Lee, ignoring his pleas for help. And when Zoe failed to stop him and ran away, he'd caught her and with a second knife he'd stabbed her too, before casually walking away. Investigations revealed he'd been watching YouTube videos about revenge and Googling methods of killing. In mitigation, his lawyer said that while in school, his teachers described him as a gentle giant, a young man with outstanding grades and great potential. He'd won a scholarship to study American football at university in Canada, but the death of his grandfather and his breakup with Zoe, it was said, left him in emotional turmoil, suicidal. After the murders, he was diagnosed with adjustment disorder. 
His lawyer said he was an adolescent who couldn't manage. Following their deaths, friends held vigils for Zoe and Lee. Today's statements were read out from their families. Zoe's mother said their world has been turned upside down and they've padlocked her daughter's room so it remains as she left it. Lee's father said he can't look at pictures of his son. Andrew Saunders is said to be genuinely remorseful and wishes he could turn the clock back. Sentencing is expected to take place tomorrow. Caroline Evans reporting a trial scheme where targets for Welsh ambulance response times were dropped for all but the most life-threatening calls is to be made permanent. The Welsh Government says the target has been met every month since it was introduced, but the Conservatives claim the system does not treat all suspected heart attacks and stroke calls seriously enough. Nearly £14 million of improvements have been approved for the Accident and Emergency Department at Aswati Gwynedd and Bangor. The redevelopment will include extra triage and resuscitation areas, as well as more treatment rooms. Paediatrics facilities and waiting rooms will also be upgraded. Tributes have been paid to Ellie Norkett, the Welsh rugby international killed in a car crash on Saturday. The 20-year-old from Clan Darcy sustained fatal injuries in a collision between Banwen and Glenith. Ellie was the youngest player at the 2014 Rugby World Cup. In a statement, her family said she was loving and caring. Her club, the Ospreys, said it's like losing a family member. As a, a key Ospreys women's player, uh, international, but also colleague to a number of the staff, it, it was quite a big shock. Um, I don't think it was until later in the evening when the the story was put out uh, nationally and then the sort of response that we had on Facebook and, and Twitter and that it really sunk in and you know it is a sad loss and I'm sure the family are, are, are feeling that. The House of Commons has been told that the case of a Bangor University student who faces deportation is serious, urgent and pressing. Shiramina Satkunaraja is due to be flown to Sri Lanka tomorrow, three months before she completes her degree. Her lawyers are asking for a last-minute review of her case. Our reporter Roger Pinney is at Bangor University for us tonight. What's the background to this, Roger? Jamie, this young woman, Shiromini Satkunaraja, has been in the UK for eight years. She initially came here with her parents. Her father was on a, a student visa, although there's a suggestion that as a Tamil, he may, they may have been escaping for, from conflict in their native Sri Lanka as well. Her father since died and she was allowed to stay in the UK to complete her school studies. She then won a place here at Bangor University and was allowed to study for her degree here whilst her appeals to stay in the UK were being processed. That's where we've got to now, Jamie. She was told last week that those appeals had failed. Whilst reporting at the local police station here with her mother, that she was detained, taken to a detention centre, and now the two women are awaiting deportation. And that, Jamie, could happen as soon as tomorrow. But she hasn't given up. She hasn't, and she has a great deal of support. She's being backed by the National... She's, she's being backed by the National Union of Students. The Bishop of Bangor has described it as a travesty if she was deported now. Bangor University has said she's an exceptional student and should be allowed to continue uh, reading for her degree. In the House of Commons today, her case was raised by the MP for Aravon, Howell Williams. Uh, and she has backing from lawyers as well, Jamie. They are working on this case. Uh, they're hoping to file an emergency uh, application again for her to stay. And in the meantime, the lawyers say the two women should be released from detention. Of course, this is all being dealt with by the Home Office. We've been in touch with the Home Office. They tell us that they won't discuss individual cases. But, Jamie, they do add this. The UK has a proud history of granting asylum to those who genuinely need it. And the Home Office says every case is carefully considered on its individual merit. So there, that's where we stand, Jamie. She could face deportation tomorrow, but her lawyers are still seeking a further appeal. Back to you. Roger Penny in Bangor, thank you. Children living in the most deprived areas of Wales are 16 times more likely to be taken into care than those living in the most affluent areas and even more likely to be on the Child Protection Register. Those are the findings of academics at Cardiff University. They claim harm to children as one of the most toxic consequences of poverty. Here's Jenny Rees. Then and now. Michael Alley was taken into care at the age of seven and brought up by foster families in one of Cardiff's more deprived wards of Wales. 
He then went on to secondary school in one of the capital's more affluent areas. It was only then he became aware of the contrast. I think it was a bit of a culture clash for me, a bit of a shock to the system when I'd say I was from Ely and there would be, other, would it be children saying, oh, you're, you're a child. You start questioning where you're from and why, why is it that? And then, you, then as I was getting, getting older, I sort of realised the streets in London are a lot nicer, the houses are a bit bigger. Michael bucked the trend and went on to university, where he examined the link between foster care and future offending. It's completely disproportionate and it, it's uh, really opened my eyes and made me realise me how lucky I am that I didn't go down that path, to be honest. I have had a stable family and a stable upbringing. The impact of poverty is far-ranging. Successive governments in Wales have attempted to improve both the health and education outcomes of children by trying to tackle the issue. But research by Cardiff University, as part of a much wider UK study, suggests child welfare is a far greater concern. With more than 5,000 children in care and nearly 3,000 on the Child Protection Register, you're 16 times more likely to be in care if you live in the most deprived areas of Wales than the least deprived, and 24 times more likely to be on the Child Protection Register. There's a lot of policy attention to reducing health inequalities and educational inequalities, which is absolutely right and appropriate. The adult outcomes, though, of harm to children are much more serious than the problems caused in adulthood by an educational underachievement or having slightly worse health. So I would say that child welfare inequalities need to be much more on the political radar. The risk of not linking the two, I think, is that we're simply scratching the surface. So we're, we're, we're doing sticking plaster work. The research in no way suggests all children in poor areas are at risk, simply that the connection is in need of attention. The Welsh Government say they'll discuss the report with the researchers and its implications for policy in Wales. Jenny Rees reporting. You're watching Wales Today from the BBC. Much more to come before 7 o'clock. Scott Williams, long to Lee Halfpenny. Chance for Wales and Lee Williams, first try of the game. Why weren't there more of these? Jonathan Davis is here to look ahead to how Wales turn around their fortunes. And the Cardiff graduate who picked up her Oscar for one of the year's top documentaries. Now, it's been debated for the best part of 30 years. Tomorrow, a five-month public inquiry begins into whether the M4 relief road around Newport should get the go-ahead. Tonight, two reports in a moment why cranes, the feathered variety, might stop the diggers in their tracks. First, Jordan Davis on the arguments for and against one of the largest civil engineering projects in South Wales. It's a saga that's had more twists and turns than a TV soap opera. The M4 Relief Road. Needed, some say, to avoid scenes like this. Bumper to bumper for hours on the M4 around Newport. It has a natural bottleneck. The Bringlass Tunnels opened in the 60s. The M4 either side was designed as a bypass. Officials recognise this stretch of road carries more traffic than it should. A relief road around Newport was first mentioned in the 90s. Fast forward to 2014 and the Welsh Government announced its preferred route, the so-called Black Route. These are the Welsh Government plans from Castleton to Mager. But this road isn't without controversy. Newport Docks isn't just a place where things float. They also fly. The owners say it'll be difficult for tall ships to access one of their docks because of the relief road passing overhead. And environmental and nature groups are worried the road will devastate places like this near the Severn Estuary. Some opposition parties are concerned about the potential £1.1 billion price tag. But the Welsh Government, several business groups and countless commuters believe it's vital, saying the road as it is acts as a natural barrier to economic growth. So this all leads us to an inquiry in Newport, where the fate of the M4 relief road will be decided. Will this be the final scene in this drama? The hopes of motorists, environmentalists and the public purse are all resting on the ending. Well, it's emerged that the preferred route for the new motorway could cut through the first nesting site in Wales for common cranes in over 400 years. Here's our environment correspondent, Stefan Messenger. The not-so-common common crane. 
Wiped out by hunting and loss of habitat, this secretive bird hadn't been seen in Wales since the Tudor age, until last spring. The story starts on the Somerset levels, where since 2010 a group of wildlife charities have been trying to reintroduce them. Can you actually see any? Yes. Yeah, have a look through there. 93 cranes have been hand-reared and released on this site, and over the course of the last six years, they've started to spread out. The pair nested successfully on the Gwent levels uh, last year and produced the first chick in Wales for, for over 400 years, which is just wonderful. If you've got cranes back in the landscape, it, it can only be a healthy landscape, really. But could this crane comeback be cut short? The new nesting site is on land the Welsh Government wants to concrete over for its billion pound upgrade to the M4. The crane is just one of a number of iconic species that environmentalists claim could be badly hit by the government's proposed M4 relief road. And that's because their preferred route cuts across another unique landscape, the ancient marshes of the Gwent Levels. The Black Route crosses areas set aside for nature conservation, five sites of special scientific interest. At Mega Marsh Nature Reserve, Gwent Wildlife Trust has received a compulsory purchase order for part of its land. The charity says it's gearing up for a David versus Goliath fight with the government. It's going to affect hundreds of hectares of wetland habitat. Uh, Thousands of metres of ditches will be concreted over. It should never have come to a public inquiry. The designations are there and it, it will be completely devastating for the wildlife. The common crane's fate may not stop the motorway from being built, but it's one example of mounting environmental concerns. Even Wales' Future Generations Commissioner, one of the government's own advisers, says she believes the plans are flawed. Mitigation measures to protect wildlife are being promised, and ministers say the public inquiry will be a chance to properly scrutinise them before a final decision on the M4's future is made. Stefan Messenger reporting. Rugby and football now. Thomas has all of tonight's sport. Jamie, any chance of winning the Six Nations title evaporated at Murrayfield. And tonight, Wales have dropped to seventh in the world rankings ahead of May's World Cup draw. Rob Howley's men failed to score a single point in the second half, a first defeat against Scotland since 2007. Well, in a moment, we'll hear from Jonathan Davis. But first, if you can stomach it, the key moments from that game. Free kick quickly taken by Rhys Webb. Scott Williams long to Lee Half Penny. A chance for Wales and Lee Williams first tie of the game. Russell to Hall. It's going to be Tommy Seymour. Russell long to Hall. Tim Visser. Oh, do you want to go corner? Ow, ow. Ow, hang on. Do you want to go corner? Shot indicated. Shot is indicated. Shot is indicated, you told me. No, it's boys, boys. Scotland over the ball again, win yet another penalty. One boot into touch and the job is done. Well, let's start with Dan Bigger seemingly overruling his captain turning down an opportunity to go for three points. An odd decision for you? Very odd. Um, it's shambolic, really, because I don't think the uh, referee was sure what was going on. But at that position, at 16-13, uh, you know, I felt that they had to go to goal, uh, for goal, especially when you know, they weren't turning the pressure into points and they haven't uh, done that over the last few games. So, surprising that uh, they went for touch and then got penalised at the next line-out. So, what should change? Would you bring in new players? Well, I think... I'd like to know first what they're trying to do uh, attacking-wise because they don't seem to create anything to ask questions of the opposition defence. We try and barge over and, you know, we're way behind on the stats with uh, tries scored in opposition 22, so they can't turn that pressure into points. If they need to freshen it up, you know, maybe Liam Williams at full-back, do you put Sam Davis in? George North has been very quiet, you put him into, uh, into the outside centre position. So, there's a lot of questions to be asked, but I'd like to know what they're trying to do offensively with, you know, Alex King and Robert Howley. For me, that, it doesn't seem that they're just creating uh, enough opportunities to score tries. 
And after that defeat, we learned tonight, they've dropped down to seventh in the world rankings. If they drop out of the top eight, they'll have a tough World Cup draw again. Is that a real worry for you? I think it is because, you know, when you don't want to be in a group of death. Last time we did well against England, so we came through and it was exciting. But for me, Wales should be in the top eight. And if they lose the next two games, the chances are that they'll be ninth and they'll be caught in a group of death again, which is a real, real shame. And up next, Ireland, a week on Friday. Yeah. They're going for the title. How do we beat them? Well, unless we score more tries, you know, we won't beat them. And unless, if we can't score tries, we should put points on the board. Um, you know, we are, we are capable of beating them if we, if we attack well. But that's, that's the big question mark now. And it's, uh, it's something that Howley and Alex King have got to work out. But two really tough games to finish the, the tournament. OK, Jonathan, always good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. A bit of football news for you now, and uh, Gareth Bale, who hobbled off in Real Madrid's win over Villarreal last night, suffered just a knock and should be fine to feature against Las Palmas on Wednesday. Bale scored in his first start for three months, but was replaced towards the end after he appeared to land awkwardly on his ankle. Wales face the Republic of Ireland in Dublin next month. And that's it for tonight, Jamie. Thomas, thank you very much. Well, amid the... Uh... Uh, amid the uh, glitz and the glamour and the confusion of uh, this year's uh, Oscars, there was uh, a win for a graduate of Cardiff University. Producer Joanna Natazagara was part of the team behind the uh, Oscar for Best Short Documentary. The White Helmets tells the story of rescue workers in the Syrian civil war. Sachin Krishnan reports. And the Oscar goes to the White Helmets. It's not the moment this year's Oscars ceremony will be remembered for. But for Joanna Natasagara, it was recognition for her part in telling the story of the White Helmets. The first responder rescue workers are estimated to have helped save the lives of tens of thousands of civilians caught up in the Syrian conflict. The short documentary shows them working in the most difficult of circumstances, including rescuing this baby alive from rubble. Speaking after the ceremony, Joanna, a Cardiff University graduate, said she had mixed emotions following her win. The whole situation is bittersweet. We wish we'd never had to make this film. We wish we didn't have to be here tonight with this award, but we do, and so we're pleased that at least they get the recognition they deserve. Watching her daughter's moment in the limelight during the early hours was mum Barbara. She heads charity Safer Wales, based in Cardiff, for whom Joanna made a film following a stint working for the organisation. You make a great documentary, you talk about the facts, you talk about truth, you give voice to people who haven't had a chance to, to give that voice before, but, but who do you put that voice in front of? And I think that's what she really finds exciting and that's what she's really good at. Um, and, and that's what I find really impressive about her work. And another person impressed with her work is George Clooney. The Hollywood star is reported to be developing a drama based on the White Helmets, meaning this is one story that could see more Oscar success in the future. And the prize for best weather picture tonight goes to Sue Charles. Jamie, thanks very much. Sadly, I fear it's more like the worst because Storm Doris and Yuan brought uh, strong winds over the last few days. Not as windy, but still very blustery over the next few days with uh, wintry showers, some drier spells and feeling colder. So tonight then, showers continue, wintry at times, any snow mainly over higher ground, but colder than recent nights. These temperatures in towns and cities around freezing, but it'll be even colder in the countryside and the Met Office has a warning out for the risk of ice on untreated surfaces. Now, the pressure chart shows some dry spells for a time tomorrow, but uh, another front pushing in from the northwest through the day. So, tomorrow it's a cold start with a frost and ice risk, some brighter spells, but then showers pushing in from the northwest, merging into longer spells of rain, becoming wintry over higher ground with sleet and snow mixed in. Brighter spells in between, especially further south, and those showers rattling through on brisk westerly winds. Now, these will reach gale force along the coast. Highs of just six Celsius in Powys, eight in Pembrokeshire. But the wind chill making it feel even colder than that. Now, tomorrow night, those fronts start to clear through. Fewer wintry showers slowly easing overnight, turning drier, blustery, but still quite cold at one to five Celsius. 
Now the chart shows a window of drier weather for a time on Wednesday, but this front pushing up from the southwest later in the day. So on Wednesday, a cold, bright start for many, but going downhill. The rain pushes up from the southwest by the afternoon and it'll stay quite chilly at 7 to 9 Celsius. So it'll stay unsettled and often very windy through the rest of the week with showers and a few sunny spells, frost patches possible by night. Thursday is a drier and brighter day and then it's looking at milder but changeable for the end of the week but uh, milder by the end of the week for the next couple of days cold enough for snow for some of us anyway mainly for higher communities but today here in Blaine for Stignog this picture was taken by our weather watcher Dan Toez now if you have any photos to help tell the weather story you can sign up and become a weather watcher and keep up to date online bbc.co.uk slash weather Jamie Sue, thank you very much. And the headlines again. Calls have been made tonight for the General Medical Council to publish its findings about a doctor who refused to see a young girl from Newport because she was late for an emergency appointment. Five-year-old Ellie Mae Clark died later the same evening of an asthma attack. I'll have an update for you here at 8 o'clock and again after the BBC News at 10. That's Wales today. Thank you for watching. From all of us on the programme, good evening.